Hello and welcome to Lunch with the Editor. As usual, we are discussing the cover story of the current issue of the Outlook magazine. This is on the politics of policing, particularly in the context of the Padmavati protests that have been rocking the polity across the country, be it uh, Rajasthan, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Punjab, even chief ministers wading into this necessarily or unnecessarily, trying to ban a movie even before it is even watched, even before the so-called film critics even got to know what is there in the movie. So in that context, we are specially looking at the politics of the police, how the police look at this sort of politics, this sort of arm twisting, this sort of muscle flexing by dominant caste groups. When dominant caste groups do muscle flexing, whatever be the reason, whatever be the cause, whatever be the trigger, the police take a completely different attitude. If it is a marginal group, as that had happened in Kairlanji over protests of Bhut Mange, the Dalit family's murder, or that of Western UP recently over Bhim Army, the police try to put it down very harshly, very brutally, very strongly. But when dominant castes get into the act, then suddenly we see the police pulling the punches. That is what we saw at Murthal during the Jat reservation agitation when so many people, so many women were brutally raped. The police did not act. Now, here in the case of Padmavati Rao, Padmavati protest, people are brazenly issuing death threats. They are inciting vandalism. They are putting a prize on the head of people, actors, directors. So there is something really, really wrong the way the police take cue from the politicians or dominant caste groups. Absolutely. And particularly in this case, it's becoming, you know, so blatantly it is being done. At times when the Taliban or such group, they would, these kind of fundamentalist group, they would issue such a warning to people. We would wonder, I mean, what is happening to that society? Now, we never expected this to happen in India. Yes, there are marks of protest. There can be group sections which can say that we don't agree with certain things or the depiction of, you know, a particular film characters in that that space they have but to issue death threats and when authorities in a way are coming in support not directly of the death threat but the court demand of banning this movie there is a big question I mean, what's happening I'm very happy that uh, our <coughs> readers and viewers are responding with uh, questions and uh, the comments somebody is asking uh, Jana Shanmugam is asking whether Padmavadi is a historical person or not. Padmavadi is an idea. I had very clearly mentioned that in my column. Padmavadi is an idea, a, a, a painful idea, a, a, an idea that inflicts a lot of pain on certain communities. So we understand the sensitivities. There is no doubt about that. But Sanjay Leela Bensali, what has he done with the idea of Padmavadi? These protesters don't even know that. Most probably, Bansali is only trying to derive some mileage, some publicity out of this controversy. I don't think that you know he would have uh, completely reinvented the story because he doesn't have that intellectual wavelength or uh, um, genius to reimagine a 700-year-old folklore. But Mavadi is a creation of a brilliant poet, uh, Mohammad Malik Jaisi. True, true. So it is the, it is it it it. it whether it is a, a character of a folklore, whether it is an idea, certain communities feel very prickly about it. 
so that has a lot to do with racial humiliation that has a lot to do with series of uh, defeats on the battlefields that has a lot to do with our colonial history so i am not getting into the facts of this or the merits of the patmavadi controversy but how are our politicians and our police responding to it the various other agencies which should have taken a very different line not this kind of a either they are absolutely silent which gives you the impression that all of them are in a way supporting what is being said or this kind of a move you know because otherwise when we've seen that something such an outrageous statement or a remark has been made immediately we find various agencies politicians getting active on how to take action against that this raises a even a wide the question that is it very selective then you know when you are trying to establish the law of the land you know there is no rule of law in the way in which the police or the government police as the mechanism is the wing of the government through which the government has to act to contain such protests so there is absolutely no rule of law in the way in which uh, these protests are being handled uh, the but bhatnagar one of our readers is uh, pointing out you know why there are no standard operating procedures yes absolutely this is what i am saying that you know there has to be when you do take action against such remarks in some corners why in the other part of the country when such a major thing is happening and which has gained so much of focus no action is being taken why are these people being allowed to make these outrageous demands remarks they need death threats that's what it is a it's a crime oh. under the indian penal code yes so nyana uh, shanmugam is again pointing out that it is uh, you know whether the government is letting the these uh, emotions come up to hide some of their problems well that is her opinion then uh, ankur singhania is also commenting on uh, what has been what has been happening well the thing is that you know the, the most shocking thing there is a, an excellent column as part of the cover package done by vapala balachandran vapala balachandran is a is an ips officer of the maharashtra cadre who also went on to become the number 2 person in uh, the cabinet secretariat he was a special secretary in the cabinet secretariat so an amazingly brilliant police officer an amazingly brilliant commentator now and he has done uh, two very interesting books so mr balachandran in his column has pointed out that india has one of the biggest police forces in the world absolutely so which is and despite having one of the biggest police forces in the world our policing is probably the most ineffective true because the number of one is it's not very clear what we want our police to do every day even the states the point that he is trying to make in in his column every day because law and order is something which is with the state government and therefore every time a new government comes more and more duties are being assigned to them which makes it absolutely impossible even for a honest dedicated cop if he wants to do his work it is not possible under the framework the kind of work is being uh, the brief that has been given to him he will not be allowed to do the work if he does it then he may get booted out absolutely that sort of a situation the saddest situation he had given a lot of examples from his tenure in the uh, maharashtra state police force and also we have a very very interesting third element from our uh, colleague bhavna which which uh, talks about the encounter cops <laughs> encounter cops encounter specialists so these are people who are specialists in eliminating in killing certain criminals and the biggest problem with these encounter cops was that they themselves at times would become criminals or would indulge in criminal activity see they, they started getting some kind of a legitimacy with the problem of terrorism because large number of people the nascent people were also being affected by that so when you have these encounter specialist cops killing xyz terrorists you know 
there was some kind of a support. Okay, he's a terrorist and this is, that's the only way of dealing. But they keep extending that authority or misusing it in where there's a personal gain, where you're getting into property dispute and several other such cases and taking sides of one party or the other and most of them have these background, you know, criminal background. So it raises the entire question of the credibility of these cops, finally. Though they may have... Credibility started, of the cops and also their political masters. Absolutely. They are the ones who are sanctioning it in the first place. If they didn't want to sanction it, if they had said, you know, there are certain ways you cannot exceed the brief beyond this, then perhaps things would have been different. Because you don't. And in fact, they have, as Bhavna's story says, out of turn promotion, the way certain cops have risen, really. So without the system, without the uh, political backing, you know, that wouldn't have been there. So that raises a big question on the political masters as well. Without the political masters sanctioning these activities, the encounter cops could not ever have done what they had done. And some of them even get killed at the hands of other criminals. Well, uh, we still retain our primary focus on the Patmavadi crisis. There should never have been uh, one at all. There was no reason. There was absolutely no reason for the political class to let this thing boil over. I mean, it is a it is a movie. Let the central uh, board of uh, uh, censorship or uh, central board of certification rather. Sorry, it's uh, a central. Let the let the central board of uh, film certification let them decide. Let them decide the so-called censor board. Let them decide whether it is uh, it ought to be screened or not. This is not some hooligans uh, call. I mean, we have a certain so-called responsible politicians issuing these death threats. Very, very sad indeed. The other big story that we have covered this week is uh, over Rahul Gandhi's imminent election to the Congress president's uh, post. So we have call, we are calling it Rahul Gandhi's tryst with transition because uh, this was a transition that was in the offing for a pretty long time and uh, finally it is happening in the next uh, uh, couple of weeks uh, hopefully. So we have an uh, eminent uh, political scientist Sudha Pai writing a column on uh, what it means to Congress and also Pranay you did a story on the um, uh, on this very aspect particularly about the possibility of uh, Rahul Gandhi becoming a prime ministerial candidate in the 2019 Lok Sabha elections. Yeah. That is something which I have tried to explain that uh, you know a lot of people say the moment Rahul becomes a president naturally or necessarily he will become the party's prime ministerial candidate and that is how they are going to project. As far as my reading goes or what I've learned is that immediately they are not going to do that. In fact, the Congress's main thrust will be to try and build a consensus, you know, among non-BJP parties, like-minded parties, and then go into the elections. Accordingly, whatever the result, depending on how the party fares, it's only then the claim will come. It may be Rahul, it may be someone else, but they are not going to go into the election by projecting only Rahul Gandhi, though there is no doubt that he will be the face of the party. He will be the face of the party is now uh, established uh, beyond any doubt with his campaigning in uh, Gujarat. Gujarat. And it has been uh, pretty effective, uh, one should uh, admit it. See, I mean, whatever be the outcome of the Gujarat elections, the fact that for a long time, or for the first time I would say since the BJP came to power in the state, that the Congress is in contention. Or Correct. people are talking about it. Earlier you never heard that there's another party which is also contesting. But for the first time you are looking at it a little more seriously and there's a varying degree of that seriousness, you know, at the way people are looking at Congress. So, as I say that, I mean, we don't know what the results will be, but Congress is giving the BJP a real challenge this time. But uh, then, uh, Pranay, how do we explain this uh, peculiar thing about uh, some of these uh, Congress leaders who keep uh, trying to project themselves as uh, potential prime ministerial candidates? I think, see, number one, there was never any doubt that these uh, so-called leaders may try and project themselves as a potential candidate, 
but finally it will come to the Nehru and the family. They will decide. Even when that Sonia Gandhi said, for instance, in 2004, when she did not become, you know, the prime minister candidate, she did not, I mean, though most people had thought at that time, and it was her nominee, Manmohan Singh. She had to give that sanction, had to come from Sonia Gandhi. I don't think Manmohan Singh on his own, you know, being outside, some others had these Absolutely. desires. So all these people who are throwing their hats into the ring are probably throwing it Without the sanction, without the sanction, and probably, not probably, happen. probably, just uh, uh, creating a problem for themselves. Absolutely, because this is not something which would uh, uh, be appreciated by the leadership, and definitely not by the rest of the Congress uh, party. True, I, I don't think because see, at the moment they are going to focus or rally behind Rahul Gandhi as a leader. After the election, and this is what they're trying to do. They try and build a consensus very successfully, which they had done in 2004. They want to repeat. And that. in terms of uh, Sonia's candidature, that definitely was a problem because you know she was she uh, is a, a foreigner who became an Indian citizen. But in the case of uh, Rahul Gandhi, there is absolutely no reason why he should not become prime minister. So I cannot understand why some of these Congress leaders still try to uh, project. A scenario wherein they have some sort of a role, you know, you have these Chidambarams and Chachita rules and all these people who harbor uh, some dream of uh, becoming a prime minister in a Congress led government. See, that, as I say, you know, uh, whichever leader, irrespective of the desire that they may have, will not be able to do it on their own because if they leave the Within the party, I doubt whether they have that kind of a support. No, not at all. Unless there are, I mean, some of them cannot even be, cannot even get elected. Absolutely. So all said and done, despite the fact the kind of beating that the Congress, or particularly the Nehru Gandhi family, has taken recently, I mean, since 2014, you know, but the way they have revived, the only way others, or especially those in the Congress, can really come back is through them, right. not outside. Right. We also have a, a beautiful package on uh, Bollywood, uh, how Bollywood has transitioned I loved it. from uh, the uh, romances of old days, people running around trees and lampposts from there uh, to very good stories, uh, proper storylines, good scripts, yeah. good movie making. So I think... Uh, Gilder yeah. has done a wonderful job in this. I mean... And Khalid Mohammed's piece uh, is uh, very interesting. Khalid Mohammed is a veteran movie critic and also a movie maker himself, a writer and a movie maker himself. So Khalid Mohammed, and then uh, we have uh, another on music. Rajiv Vijaykar who is uh, written on uh, the Bollywood music. So that's also another package which I thought has uh, turned out pretty well. Already the kind of feedback here yes. I have got in the second it was. Quite good, quite encouraging for Giriza and I'm, I'm sure. Absolutely. So, uh, this is uh, what our latest issue is all about. I would still like to look at some of these uh, quest, uh, questions and remarks that have come up from our readers. Uh, Tej Krishan Valli is saying that I am totally against hooliganism and threats given by the radical people, but Bansali has given a wrong pitch, picture of what was the historical fact. We don't know. We don't know whether Bensali has any picture at all, whether he has any understanding or idea at all, or whether it is just a costume drama and all this is only to ensure that a, there is a very good first day collection at the box office. So, so I really don't know what uh, this uh, director has done apart from create a controversy to gain uh, some money, some publicity. Then Amarjeet Singh Rayat. Said, saying that, don't you think it's abnormal so much ruckus without seeing the film? Absolutely. That's a good point. Absolutely. You know, even if it is very prickly, even if it is a very tricky sort of a situation, watch the movie. Then, uh, Jnana Shanmugam, again, why the courts won't take a so moto stand to order the government to control the lawlessness in Patmavadi issue? Well, it's a very valid point. So, those were the comments. Thanks. All of you for joining, that's all for today.